All right, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time together to share in your word and to learn mm. it, to know more about it, and to obey it. We ask you, Lord, to bless us in our study, enlighten our hearts, our minds, so that we may be guided by you. Mm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so today we're going to look at chapter one of Romans, mm -hmm. and as you know, I like to I like us to read a chapter first so that uh, we feel it in our souls and bodies, and uh, and so if uh, I would like four persons to read, I know I promised Bryce that he will read this evening because um, um, he missed out on this morning, so one jumped ahead of him. So I, I want one person to read verses 1 to 7, a per, second person from verses 8 to 17, then 18 to 25, 26 to the end. So Bryce, which one are you reading first? You want I'm to start? I'm going to read uh, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. Okay, good. You will start. Someone else, 8 to 17? I read 8 to 17. Iris, um, 18 to 25? I'll read that. That is Elita. I see Elita. And 26 to the end. I can do 26 to the end. Okay, Marilyn. Okay, all right. Let's begin, Bryce. This letter and is I think, from... Hold on a minute. I think I saw Lisa's hand just now, too. So, Lisa... You got, no, you got it was she got me she got first she right got but you get first dibs next week okay oh, okay <laughs> go ahead, go ahead okay. Bryce sorry this is a letter from Paul a slave of Christ Jesus chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news God promised his good news long ago through his prophets in the holy scriptures the good news is about his son. In his, early, in his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. And he was shown to be the son of God. When he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and the authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and will obey and will obey him bringing glory to his name and you have included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ i am writing to to all of of you in Rome who are loved by God are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Thank you, um, Bryce. Uh, Iris. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom... I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son. Is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, 
first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Thank you, um, Iris. Uh, Elita? Okay. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness, in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Thank you, Elita. Marilyn? Okay. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, con covetousness, molest, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, yet they not only do them but even applaud others who practice them. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, uh, let me, good. Now, thank you, uh, Bryce and Iris and uh, Elita and Marilyn. Now, Paul begins all of his letters with his name. He identifies who the writer is. So you will see in Romans chapter one, he begins Paul. If you go to Corinthian letters, you begin Paul. You know exactly who it is that is writing. And it's Paul who writes. You know, normally when we write letters, we put our name last. He puts his first. So you see it up front. And then he goes on to describe himself. He talks about himself being of a, a servant of Jesus. And he says that he's been called to be apostle and that he has been set apart for the gospel of God. And so we see that uh, um, by calling himself a servant, some translations use the word slave, it just means that he describes himself as a loyal servant of God. The same way that, you know, there's a servant and a master, he, he is loyal to his master who is God and who is Christ. He is a servant um, of, of, and he obeys his master as well. So he is more or less an obedient servant of God. But he's also an apostle, and the apostleship comes where he's been given authority to preach the gospel, um, just like all the other apostles were given authority to preach the gospel. Now, you will know the word apostle describes the, the 12 disciples, but Really and truly, the word apostle really means um, to be sent out, 
Um, and we see that in Luke chapter six. So, 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 so um, uh, Paul, by encountering Jesus, believes that he was sent out to preach the gospel, to preach the good news of Christ. And, and, and so this whole notion, he believes that he's received this special command from the Father and also the Son. Yeah, he also uh, writes other uh, letters. Uh, what else is it? Uh, he also writes letter, uh, letters when he uh, tells his first name. He was like writing letters to the Colossians. Yes, the, Gal the, the Colossians the and the Galatians, the Galatians um, and Ephesians and so Ephesians forth. Ephesians and, yeah. and also Titus, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Correct. The, the Thessalonians and Hebrews. Correct, correct, correct. So, so here is, is that we, so Paul now as an apostle, he, but not only is he, the whole word apostle means to be sent out, but it, not only for people like Paul, but really and truly all Christians should declare God's good news. All people should be speaking about the gospel. And so we find that, um, uh, as I asked the others this morning a question, who in the church today, I mean, there are some, there are some denominations that refers to some of their, their ministers as apostles. But if we were talking about the Episcopal church, who today is that the church normally refers to as apostles? Anybody I'd say know? Bishops. So. Not you, Bryce. You were there this morning. <laughs> yes, right. the bishops. Uh, Bryce, you can't answer. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. Bishops, so I want to answer. The, the, thank you, Bryce. Bishops in the bishops in the church are usually seen as apostles, but in the but in the true sense of the word, all of us are called to be apostles. <laughs> all of us have been um, have been are sent out. To, to declare God's word. And so even so when like we do Christian our Deacon even Deacon when or, even uh, even when we do our dismissal on a Sunday morning, um, we say go in peace to love and serve the Lord. It isn't that we just stay at home, um, we, we just take what we got in the church and keep it to ourselves, but we share it. Even 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 like for me, when I tell you, uh, uh, please take your bulletin home and share it with a neighbor or a friend, uh, that is even part of the whole notion of sharing so that others may know um, uh, and may want to come and be a part of, of God and, and Christ. So it is important that uh, we realize that we are all called to be apostles, not only bishops, but priests, deacons, all of us who are Christians. Yes, Iris. So the bishop is the apostle. Is one of his jobs to go to each of his churches? Correct. Correct. And that's why he moves around. He moves around. But 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 it, and, and, but even for us as Christians, um, our movement or our being sent out is to be among God's people, not necessarily just the churches, although those are God's people, too, but any person. So, yes, but you are right. Correct. Now, um, and so we go on to where where. Um, uh, Paul continues that the, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the old holy scriptures regarding his son was as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with the power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we see Paul now going into more depth, telling us about the the, the um what the the prophets have told us in in terms of the birth and life and death and resurrection of Jesus, there were many promises in the Old Testament that speaks to this whole coming of Christ. And then he even then in verses three and four goes on to to mention two verses that show what the good news is. Um, and, and it's important because it shows us that Jesus belonged to the family of King David. Paul showed, made mention of that, a descendant of David um, in verse 3, and that he was also the son of God, which he refers to him in verse 4. So, um, and this whole notion, Paul is 
putting into perspective um, this whole notion of the good news, the gospel. And as you realize, one of the outlines that I gave you, it speaks, the, the, the outline speaks specifically to the nature of the gospel and how the gospel is in our lives. And Paul is, is, is outlining here that the gospel is primary for us in our lives as Christians. So, so, um, uh, and then he also uses the word Christ, which is a familiar, a special word for meaning for the Jews. Um, the Jews were always looking for the Messiah. Remember that Christ means the Messiah. It's another word for the Messiah. And so Christ, Christ or Messiah has special meaning for the Jews because Jesus uh, was the king that God had promised to them. Although some up to this day don't recognize that, some did. And, and, um, and then I don't, and then the word Lord, Jesus Christ or Lord, Lord was a term which the Gentile Christians were more familiar with. Um, so the Jewish Christians were more familiar with the word Christ. The Gentile Christians were more familiar with the word Lord. Um, and, and because they were accustomed to obeying their human masters and they called them Lord. Um, but here the word Lord was also the usual translation of God's special name in the Old Testament. So it also reminded people that Jesus is God. And then when we come to verse five, um, we see the word grace is used. We receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And we see this whole word that grace, which is a gift that nobody deserves, but which God gives out of his own free, free will. And Paul used to think that he could please God by his own efforts. And he tried to obey all the details of the law and and um, but and he but he now he knew that he could not earn eternal life by just works. It was God's kind gift, and Paul had received it by means of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And also, Paul realizes through this word grace that he did not deserve to be an apostle. Um, um, and, and that it was, again, God's grace that had chosen him. As I even say to, to folks um, who are even ordained for that matter, that, you know, you don't have a right to be a priest or a deacon. It is because of God's grace that he has chosen you to be a priest or a deacon or what have you. And so, and so you find that Paul doesn't want people to praise him. Paul wants you to give honor to Christ, and he always focuses um, on Jesus. He does not focus on himself. He wanted, to, he, 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 um, he, God sent him to the Gentiles to teach them, and he wanted the Gentiles to obey Jesus if their faith is sincere. And so when we come to verses six, uh, verse seven, you see that who he is writing to, he is writing to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Um, and, and so we, we, we see for, for, the, for the first time who Paul is addressing. He's addressing the Christians in, this, in, the, in, in, the, in Rome. There were Jewish Christians. There were Gentile Christians. Um, uh, but he also refers to them as saints, which is another word. And I think um, uh, someone's translation had it, holy people, which is what the word saints, um, um, uh, the term means. And it's a, the basic idea of the, of the Greek for this word is holiness, that we are holy. Even us who are members of all saints are also saints because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. It is the Holy Spirit that makes us holy. Uh, not that we are always behave holy, but the fact is, is that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And that is what sets us apart. 
And so we find that in the Old Testament, we can read how God loved the Israelites, and he had chosen them to be his holy nation. Now, Gentiles in Rome were also God's saints, God's holy people, um, as we see here. And, and one of the things about being a saint in that is that we too, that saints and God's people are also set apart to God. And as I said, they've been made holy by the Holy Spirit and that God has chosen us to be his saints, to be his holy people. But it does not mean that we do nothing. We still, we have responsibility as saints um, on behalf of God. And, and that first section, Paul finishes this up with a greeting, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not bring you greetings on his own accord. He is bringing you greetings based on the gospel for whom he preaches. And you will see that same kind of greeting in Peter's letters as well. So not only are they in Paul's letters, they're also in Peter's letters because they're not focusing on themselves. They're focusing on God. They're focusing yeah, on John, Christ. Yeah, John writes letters about about, about about God and the Gentiles as well, too, in John 1, John 2, and John 3. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. then the book of Revelation according yes. to John as well, too. Yeah. So so here so here we and see... He do write letters. Yeah. So here we see this whole notion that um, Paul uses grace, which is God's unmerited favor um, to us, and he uses peace, which is the total well-being that only God can provide us. Uh, as we know that prayer, um, the, that God provides the peace that passes all understanding. And so God provides peace for uh, provide fully only to those who are at peace with him. Um, any questions before I move on to the second? And uh, no, no, the other thing, oh, I'll come to you, Lisa. And the only other thing I will say is, is that this whole word grace and peace, these two words, grace and peace, we need to see them too as both gifts from God, that they're both gifts um, from, from Jesus. And normally, um, uh, even although Paul begins this, this, these words as a greeting, he normally also finishes with similar words as a doxology. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. He normally finishes his letters with those words as well. Yes, Lisa, sorry. No, that's okay. <clears throat> you, I, you started to say... I, I don't really know what my question was now. It was it was about peace and grace and mercy. Like I don't I don't really get that. It, I just it's it's too much of a conversation for now. It's mm -hmm. like this sort of exit. Like I just don't get grace and I don't really get mercy. Um, you know, and I think of like Christmas time. Oh, peace and joy and isn't everything mm -hmm. wonderful? But it feels like to me there should be more. When, when we talk about when we are talking about peace, um, oftentimes you see we, we we see peace as seeking peace in our like the same way we seek strength, we seek our own type of peace. Um, like for example, you mentioned Christmas, um, I, and I think I've mentioned this to you all at some point in time, but I may not. It might be another church that I did. We often time. What is the favorite? What is the premier um, biblical passage at Christmas time? Anybody can tell me that. I can't hear you, Pam. In the beginning was the word. No, not that. Not that. Well, to me, it's that's the premier one. <laughs> well, they, they, well, well, all right. Let me rephrase. Well, I say premier among people, what people like to hear. Um, that is more the theological. In the beginning was the word. No, that's no. <laughs> people don't like to hear that. That's not the first one at Christmas. The one that they love to hear at Christmas, that's a theological one. But the one that people like to hear at Christmas is um, glory to God in the highest and on earth. The King, 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 and, and the King James Version says, peace, to, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Whereas all the other translations says, peace to people of goodwill. 
mm. or peace to people of whom God favors. If you read mm. that passage in in Luke, um, where uh, where where um, um, it is it is said. Let me see if I could find it quickly. Let's turn to it. Anyone has King James Version there? No, I, I don't. I have um. No, I have the Revised Standard Version. Do you can you look up King James Version for me quickly, Pam? Because I want you to read the King James Version. Now, let me tell you. Where is it? Hold on. Where is it? The birth of Jesus. Um, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Let Pam first read what the King James Version says, and then I will ask a couple of you to tell me what yours say and tell me what your translation is. Go ahead, Pam. Unmute yourself, please. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Good. You hear that? Yeah. Peace, goodwill toward men. All right. Who has another translation? I have another translation, Father. What is your translation, Bryce? Glory to God. Bryce, the what is your, Bryce, Bryce, what's your translation first, please? Um, it's the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. Go ahead. Okay. Um, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. You heard that? No, I have thank, new, thank you, Bryce. Yeah. Another translation? Yes, Iris. What's your translation? I have international. Okay. International. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Okay. Anyone else has a different translation? I, yes, I, I see Lisa and then Marilyn. Lisa, okay. what's your translation? Um, revised Standard Version. Mm -hmm. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Okay. Oh, and, and Marilyn? Thank I you. Have yeah, I have the Access Bible, which is an ec economical learning resource that says for people of faith. But mine says, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Correct. Now, so you see here in all in the only and all and, and the point I'm trying to make is is going back to what Lisa is saying is this whole notion of peace is that when Paul offers peace, he's offering a peace where um, uh, 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 those who fully, um, that, that God can provide and does provide fully peace to those who are at peace with him. Um, if we, if we you, you get where I'm coming from now, Lisa? Yeah, yes. Right. And, and it shows you in the, it shows you in only in the King James Version, and there's believed to be an error in that version in, in terms of how it was written, because the King James Version makes it sound as if everybody will get peace. Mm -hmm. But the peace comes to those with whom mm -hmm. God favors, those who are at peace with him, because the peace that we get the, the real inner peace that we really want and desire and long for comes only from God. Um, um, mm. You know, it's the, the strength that we want and that we, that sometimes that we often so want, it comes only from God. We could try as much as we like to do it in our own strength and in our own power. It will never, ever feel the same way as if we depend on God to give us the strength. And it's the same way with peace. <laughs> that God gives us the peace. So, so, so I hope that helps you a little bit more. That's that. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yes. Beth. Sorry for the di diversion. I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 it's not. Oh, no, 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 no. Never be sorry. Okay. Never be sorry. Yes, Beth. Um, I have a question. You had said that um, Christ means Messiah to the Jews. Christ means Messiah. Right. And I guess I had always, I had learned that Christ, the interpretation or the translation was word of God. So going back to the Christmas story, when one says Christ is born, 
that would mean, and for translation would be the word of God is born. And, you know, one hears that, you know, Jesus is God's word made flesh. And so being taught or learning or, or hearing Christ means the translation is word of God made sense. So I guess I was surprised when you said it means Messiah. Yeah. You see, I have the, the, the true meaning of Christ is, and this, which is the same as Messiah, mm -hmm. is it means the anointed one. That is what it means, the anointed one. Um, uh, I have not heard, and I may be wrong, I don't remember. I have not heard it being used in the context that, it's, that it means that. Yes, Christ is the word of God. That is true. But being the word Christ, meaning the word of God, I, I, I am not saying that that is not right or that's, that it's wrong. I'm not saying that at all. It is just that I have always learned that when we refer to Christ, that's why you, you will find that on Sundays, I always pause after Jesus before I say Christ, because he's really Jesus the Christ and not Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ <laughs> is his title. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. And both these words, one Greek, one I think is Hebrew, they both mean the same thing. Um, and, and therefore, it has always mean the anointed one. Now, whether or not the Christ being made, mean in the word of God would also make me think then that the Messiah must also mean the same thing because the two of them are intertwined. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the person teaching that class that I took was trying to, you know, like just what you said, you know, Christ is not his last name. Mm -hmm. You know, he was, um, you know, he, he is, he was, you know, he was Jesus from Nazareth, you know, Correct. Knew him. that was his name. Exactly. Yeah. That was his name. Yeah, Christ, as you said, you know, um, um, and, and then when I had, I actually, I read online when I looked up all saints before I even went to all saints that, that I guess um, you had written in your letter that people had asked you why you pause between teaching Jesus and yes. Christ because yes. you he's the Christ and I thought yes. oh Jesus the word of God you know so yes. I guess uh, but it, but I think it's all in, it's certainly all intertwined I right? think it's all intertwined and that's why I'm not saying that you are incorrect I'm not saying that because he is the word of God Mm -hmm. um, as, as Pam was alluded to earlier, when she started out, she says, in the beginning was the word. That's her premier um, mm -hmm. uh, Christmas yeah. verse. And so when, we, when you read John chapter one and verse one and following, you, you learn that the word is Christ. The word is Jesus. The word is the Messiah. And so um, it is all intertwined. But really and truly, <clears throat> when, we're, when we, 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 we are seeing, you see, as you cor correctly said earlier, Bev, when he was born, he was Jesus of Nazareth. He was just Jesus. And then he became Jesus of Nazareth. But then when he started to preach is when the term Christ and he, used, and he started identifying himself as the son of God, then is when the word, the Messiah and the Christ started to come into play. And it was because um, the, the Jews knew that the, the, the Messiah was promised and this was so, and this was promised in the Old Testament. So, so we have this whole notion of, of, G, of that term coming later on. He was not baptized with that term, if you want to put it that way, or or or, or whether you want to you want to call it, yeah. Okay, um, let's continue. So then we come to verses eight through fifteen, and we and we realize that that Paul begins here this section by first thanking God, um, and he and you and again he says God through Jesus. Um, Christ for all of you, um, because your faith is being reported all over the world. So here, uh, the news of the faith of the Roman church has reached people everywhere, and, G and Paul is thanking them for their faith. You know, as I, I said this morning, it, it is interesting because he begins by thanking people for their faith, but by the end of the chapter, he's telling them how bad they are. <laughs> You know, it's almost like buttered them up for the kill. You know? <laughs> so he's telling them how, nice, how, you know, we thank you for your faith. And he, and he speaks in verses 9 and 10 about praying for the Christians in Rome. Um, um, 
although he was not responsible for their faith, he prayed, he, he, he tells us, um, uh, uh, God whom I serve in my whole heart and preaching the gospel of his son is my witness, how constantly I remember you in my prayers um, at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to, to you because he had never visited them before. He was not responsible for their faith or for the forming of their church, but he always wanted to, 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 to visit them. And so he's saying here, if it is God's will that I visit you, I will, I, I, I will, um, uh, I will be there to see you. So it is interesting here is that Paul, you know, he starts off with these glowing favor, favorable words um, to the Romans, to the Roman church, but then he's going to tell them about God's wrath upon them um, um, in, 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 um, shortly. And, and, and the thing is, and he taught, and he even says to them that he wants to make their faith strong. When you get to verses 11 and 12, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. And Paul had always felt that the, the, the Roman church may not have been started by any of the apostles. And hence, he's using this whole notion some, that, that, that to part you some spiritual gift to make you strong. And, and even in terms of using the word uh, gift, it, it could also, it, it, it may not mean the gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, um, but that he wanted to teach them um, and to emphasize and emphasize the whole notion of who Christ, who God in Christ is. So uh, we, we find that there. And then we go on, when you go on um, um, in verses 13 and 14, um, I do not want you to be, I do not want you to be unaware brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. And, and you could tell he's, in this case, addressing the Gentiles, the, the Gentile Christians particularly. Remember, Paul had four other churches. The Roman church, he did not. Um. And then when we get into, well, he goes on in verses 14, he talks about, and 15, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. This is, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are um, um, Rome. So in other words, what he's saying is that he feels he, he has a duty to preach to everyone, that the gospel is for everyone. It's not for a certain set of people. Um, it's for all people. Um, and even when he re, and then, I mean, even when he uses the word Greeks and non Greeks, he's I mean he, when he talks about Greeks, he's not only meaning people um, from Greece. It meant those who would have spoken the Greek language, because not only Greeks uh, preached the Greek, um, um, spoke the Greek language, other people did as well, because the Greek culture was quite. Um, rampant in in in, in, the, in the, the time. Um, any questions before we get on to verses sixteen and seventeen and moving forward? Okay. Yeah. Now we we come to a part now where um, you're, we are going to be looking more so at the righteousness from God, and 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 Paul begins this section in declaring up front, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so Paul's words about the gospel here, he is very bold about it. Um, whatever other people said, Paul will declare the gospel. He was not not ashamed of it. And he felt that the gospel is essential because it is God's message. And it is a message for every person and for, all, for every nation. And so um, 
for, for Paul, the gospel is powerful because it is essential. And, and as I said earlier, one of the handout, one of the outlines I gave, it speaks specifically uh, right throughout about the gospel because that is where Paul is stemming from. It's about Christ. It is about God through Christ working and, 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 and telling us um, how we are to live our lives. Um, and, and, that, and, and, and so once you live out that gospel, Paul is telling us that the gospel will change us. It changes people's lives and it causes people who, are, who, who dislike God to become people of God once they will heed it and read it and heed it and act upon it and live it. So it is an important message um, that Paul wants to get out there, and it's an important message that Christians should want to to help to to um, to reveal to others as well. Um, so for Paul, the gospel is the most important message. It is a message about how people become Christians. It is a message about how Jesus died for us and rose from the dead for us. So, so this is the cent this is central to, to Paul. Um, and, and, and so it is not only for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles as well. We all need, and we should not be ashamed of it. You know, oftentimes we are afraid to tell people, we even go to church for the word to tell them about the gospel. And, and, and Paul is saying here, Paul is saying here, that cannot be because I am not, and we are not to be as well. Um, and, 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 and the whole notion of it is, is that, is that um, for the, in the gospel, a, 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 um, oh, before we even get there, for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for everyone who believes, because not everyone is impressed with the gospel message. And that is a point that Paul is saying to us, that the gospel message does not impress everyone. People may say that it is too simple. People might say it is foolish. People will say, I don't believe in it. Um, and, and so, uh, but, but, but for him, that is not the case. He even tells Timothy, when he writes Timothy in the second letter, that you are not to be ashamed of the gospel, that he himself suffered much because he was not ashamed of Jesus. And, 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 and we cannot be ashamed of Jesus. That's why even today in the world, there are still people who are being killed as Christians because they're not afraid to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. They're not afraid to say who Jesus is. And so, and so it is interesting because Paul himself, who was a Jew, um, uh, um, would have known that many Jews could not believe the message about Jesus, um, that they, they, they could not believe that God's Messiah will die on a cross. And so, and so uh, um, even Gentiles thought that the message of the cross was foolish. How could God's Messiah die on a cross? Why would God die on a cross? Um, was was, was uh, uh, a message which people did not approve of and which people did not honor. And yet Paul says, no, that is not true, that he did die on a cross because, because, because. And we will see that play out in the letter. Um, when we go on now to verse 18, we will see, we will see here that um, uh, Paul now starts to, to, to bring on his venom on the people, and we come to that section of the, of the chapter where he, Paul now looks at the unrighteousness of the people, and he starts off with the Gentiles, in this section, the rest of chapter one, and he will go on to talk. Do you want to say something, Beth? No, no. Oh, okay. I thought I saw your hand go up. That's right. Okay. My glasses. <laughs> oh, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. No problem. And then in chapter two, he's going to talk about the Jews. Um, and then in chapter three, he's going to like give a whole summary of all people. But in, in essence, what Paul is going to start saying here is 
is why we need the gospel. And he's going to break, he's going to, he's going to start off by, by saying what people have been doing um, that has caused him now to think that people need the gospel and need to be, need to be um, just, need justification, need to be made right with God. So here Paul begins in verse 18 about the wrath of God, the anger of God. But we must realize that God's anger is not like our human anger, which is often selfish. God's anger is because of the sin that is going on in the lives of people, and that is hurting him and disappointing him. And that is why he is, he, 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 he expresses the wrath of God. Um, and so you will, you, will, you will see the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what they may be known about God is plain to him, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And so um, uh, Paul is saying here that people can learn about God's character from the nature of what is going on in the world around them. You have no excuse to say you don't know about him unless you probably live out in some place where there's nobody else you don't know what's going on in the whole world but we but but the thing is about it is is that um god's character even although you may you you may not um know uh also, although it may not have been made known to you about god yet what you see happening in the world and what you see going on um and that that there must be God. Um, and so he, Paul was thinking about the account of how God created the world um, and that people chose not to worship the real God. And we will see that. And he goes on when he talks about in verse 21, he says, for although they knew God, they neither glorify him as God nor give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and, and, and animals and reptiles. So here we see that um, um, Paul alludes to the idols, these, these false gods that people have made for themselves instead of worshiping the real God, that they have made, uh, they have made idols of what God had created. And we know this from the Israelites who had made the golden calf and, 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 and um, um, I think at one time they had made an ox, the image of an ox um, for God. And they did all these false gods um, and worship false gods um, in this country called Moab. And, they, and so Paul is alluding to, to this kind of, of anger that God has for those who do that. Um, and then he goes on into, um, and he speaks it here, you see it here, therefore God gave them over in sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. And then, it, and then we see Paul goes in now um, into, uh, and this morning it was, it, you know, pe it, a, a, a subject which has become very touchy, which is the, the, the subject of uh, the verses of 26 and 27. Uh, because of this, God gave them over to shameful loss. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and, re and receive in themselves the due penalty of their perversion. And this is always, and, and, and there's always been two sides to this story because uh, one side claims that this has to do with God not um, in favor of, um, of same-sex re relationships and, and in, in, in whole homosexuality. And so we have those who believe that these passages, just like the one in Genesis in Sodom and Gomorrah, um, which talks about um, 
um, the the men come into Lot's home and 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 Lot offer and who had guests who were men in his house and Lot um, uh, instead wanted to give them his daughters, but these men on the outside wanted to have. Um, have the men instead. And we see that again in Judges chapter 19, a similar situation happening. And, and, and so when, when the folks have uh, uh, read this, it be, it, uh, they feel as if uh, this, these kinds of passages speak about, speak against um, homosexuality and same-sex relations. Um, but there is the, the other side of this story is, is when we, we look at these passages, um, do these passages address um, uh, really what um, um, same-sex relationships of love and intimacy and, the, the, and one of the things that we have to realize that was going on in the Roman time and even in other times as well is that when, um, um, when these acts were happening, there were one that it was uh, the, the Roman situation at the time is that people were doing things that were excessive. There was, there was um, um, great promiscuity and even to the extent of rape is as well um, there were even older men who who would take younger boys all of this was going into the culture of Rome um, and 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 to be honest some of it was in the name of worship and so uh, and so the whole notion as to whether or not um, uh, this passage in the Bible, which is usually taken for some to be uh, against homosexuality, that it is not against same-sex relations that are in a mutual committed relationship, but those who are um, more or less being promiscuous. And it could even go with, with, with heterosexuals as well, if you're in promiscuous heterosexual relationships. But mainly here, they're talking about um, with same, same, same sex relationships, but it's not those who are in committed loving relationships. That's the other side of, of, of the coin. And, and so, as I said to the folks this morning, that, you know, we, 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 we have to recognize the, the, the culture in which all this was taking place, and it was taking place in the Old Testament culture as well, where there was a there was this whole notion of, of promiscuity. There was this whole mo motion notion of of rape, um, and and so um, it does not apply to to uh, what we see in today's culture when it comes to persons who are in mutual relationships. Um, and as I, and I also said, I mean, someone, we, we, someone in the class even this morning we, we told about their grandson who is and so forth. And, and, and it comes back to as well, that even in cultures, even in our own culture, where we're, we're we have to leave this all up to God. And, 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 and instead uh, of persons who can, you, you have in a day and age now where people who condemn this are then later on found out that they are as well. And, and we see that among our own, among pastors and politicians and all of this sort of stuff. But the, the, the so, so in a nutshell, we, we, we have to realize that Paul here is addressing um, sexual excess and lust. He talks about lust, and, and, uh, which was uh, contrary to the cultural purpose for sex and marriage in those days. And even in ours, it was for, uh, for, uh, largely foreign um, to us. So uh, any questions on that before I move on? Anyone has any questions? Okay, um, 
And then you see what Paul does here is, is that he continues and he talks furthermore. He says, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with, every, and he's talking now about the Gentile Christians as a whole. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are filled of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. They are gossips, slander. God haters, insolent, um, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And, you know, when you hear all of these names, all these different people, the first thing that comes to mind is, gee, all of us must be going to hell. You know, <laughs> we all gossip, we all slander at times. We, uh, you know, but this is not what Paul is talking about. Again, Paul is talking about people here who, whose everyday lives is this. And I would, and, 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 and whose everyday life is, is, is about, is about evil and wickedness and just, and just trying to 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 be greedy and 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 that sort of thing. So it isn't and it isn't and it isn't. Um, it, he's not talking here about people who this. I mean, we are not perfect. We are all sinners. We will sin from time to time. But this is not how we generally want to live or seek to live. Um, Paul is talking about people who live this way. This is their being. This is who they are. And, and so um, we need to be uh, cognizant of that. These are people, and, 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 and what God has done is, is, is that he has allowed them um, to engage in these sort of things. Not that, they, not that it's, um, uh, it is acceptable to be, it's not acceptable to be a God hater or a slanderer or whoever, but it means that God has given the people the opportunity to make decisions. And these are the way how people live on and, um, all their lives. Um, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes, yes, Beth. Is all, we're just looking at this and based on what you just said, mm -hmm. and I've heard someone say this, is all, I mean, sin is sin. Mm -hmm. But when one talks about sin, a lot of time one talks about other people's sins, like murder or thief. <laughs> so I guess my question is, and I know, I, I think it's the Catholic church. I don't know that there's cardinal sins, like there's different levels of sin. Mm -hmm. Does the Episcopal church believe that there are different levels of sin or is just sin sin? You know, how, how is, how is that? We, we, uh, as far as I know, <laughs> as far as I know, we don't have any cardinal sins. I mean, okay. we, we, we are all, we, we all sin and fall short, you know, um, um, uh, yeah, we don't. I, uh, we we. I, I don't remember the, the Episcopal Church having any doctrine where there is a division, a step in, a, a, a pecking order of sins. Um, um, Doesn't the Roman Catholic Church though have a? Have yes, a, you I mean, are not correct. To pick on anybody. No, 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 no. But yes, you are. You are. You are right. Um, but we don't. And and the major thing is is that. Um, I've always said to folks, and I said it even this morning, I said, there's two questions I believe that God is going to ask us or St. Peter or whoever we meet at the pearly gates. One, did you love God? And two, did you love your neighbor? And that is, and that is important. Um, I was reading also here just the other day, and I was trying to remember where I read it, where um, you know, we, we, we criticize folks, and it's, and it's something in the Bible I read, we criticize folks, um, oh God, I wish I could remember the passage, but we criticize folks for things um, um, that they do, but we are doing the, the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, 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 the, and the question was, you know, which is worse? Mm -hmm. you know which is worse 
So, uh, and it goes back to the whole notion of the Pharisees wanting to look good on the outside, but on the inside, they were not. And it, and it stems, and it stems also from that, from what's coming from our heart. And so- That was also but, the, um, <clears throat> um, also the, um, yeah, you're talking about the Pharisees, they, they were guilty. Yes. Not only the Pharisees was uh, guilty, the, uh, the Sadducees were yes. guilty. Yeah, but so- and the Samaritans yes. were also guilty. Yeah. So, so to answer your question back, Beth, you know, no, we don't have any cardinal sins uh, and all of that. We, you know, you, you sin, you have fallen short. Um, uh, there, is, there is room for repentance and forgiveness from God. Um, and and because, that's, because God is a person, is a being who does not want to just um, bring his wrath on us. That's not who God is. God, yes, he knows that we sin, but there's always the need of forgiveness because that's why his son came in the first place. Um, and he will truly forgive us if we really believe in that he will be forgive us. Yes, mm -hmm. Pam. Oh, and then uh, you, Bryce. Mm -hmm. According to Wikipedia, the seven deadly sins are often called cardinal sins. In the Episcopal and Church? No, no, just oh. in, in Christianity oh, in, Christianity, in general. Christianity, yes, which is in the general. whole thing, which is lust and, um, oh, uh, I don't remember them now. Gluttony, gluttony uh, procrastination, avarice, yeah. yes. sadness, wrath. Yeah. That's Injection. Not I, I don't know. I'm 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 reading really quickly. Yeah. Um, but there are the seven deadly sins. You know, there's a wine called the seven deadly sins too. I've drunk. I've had it before. I've had it. Yes. <laughs> I've had it. It's, it's so I have drunk. I have drunk. I have drunk them all. Oh, it's a, it's <laughs> sins with a Z. I it's think it's sins. Z. Yes, you're right. That's have a Z. It's, yes, it does have okay. a Z. It's because it's a Zinfandel. Yes, it That's is. That's right. <laughs> That's is. right. It is. You're it's right. Not that I know my wives. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, here's the list. Pride, mm -hmm. greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and slothfulness. Yes, yes. Um, but I, I just, let me have the floor for one, two more minutes. Yes. Mortal sins, Beth, is probably what you're thinking of. Catholic, Roman Catholic um, talk about mortal sins. And mortal sins um, is a gravely sing sinful act which can lead to damnation if there's no repentance. Yeah. Um, and then, interestingly, I've never heard this before. There are three cardinal sins in Judaism, mm -hmm. um, which are idolatry, sexual misconduct, and murder. Mm. And that's what I learned about cardinal sin. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah. Not as fun yeah. as Cardinal Zinn. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, the thing is about it is, is that uh, uh, since we are on that, and I'll come back to you, just give me a, just, just give me a minute, um, um, Bryce, I'll come back to you. But one of the other things that we need to also, uh, that is mentioned in the Gospels, is that there's only, and, and, and that there's only one, um, unforgivable sin, um, which is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Um, that is the only sin that we know about in the Bible that is, um, that is unforgivable. And, I, and it's in core, it is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. I, I don't know if Pam can tell you where they are quickly for me, but, um, and I think they're also in a couple of other passages, maybe it feels to me like Hebrews might be one or something like that. But, but it is, see, that, see, the, 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 that is um, the, the, the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is when some person who repeatedly um, rejects the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, yes, yes, Pam. Matthew 12, 31. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not Correct. be forgiven. Correct. That is the only one. So if there's any cardinal sins in the Episcopal Church, it would be that one. <laughs> because right. we, go, we, tend, we tend to at least, uh, we tend not to try to make up these things, but stick to what is there. So that would right. be, if anything, that would be the cardinal sin for the Episcopal Church. Yes, Bryce, you were going to say something. 
Yeah, what I don't get is that is that is that people who do bad things, even throughout the Bible, whether mm -hmm. it's in the New Testament or the Old Testament, mm -hmm. is that why are they getting themselves in trouble? Like, why did Cain get himself in trouble? Why did he murder his brother? Because he was maybe because he was jealous, or maybe because he just didn't like his brother. But that's no reason that he had to murder Abel. Yeah, but it's the same. But but Bryce, uh, I understand your point. But it's the same thing that happens today in our world, in our life, in our communities. Mm -hmm. Why do somebody kill somebody else? Um, um, and it's for that same. Is it is it's for that same reason. In 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 obviously in Cain's sense. We, we obviously, well, I should say obviously, because anything is not always obvious, but it, it, the, the appearance is, is that he was jealous of his brother um, uh, because his brother's gift was accepted by God and his wasn't. And so um, obviously there was a sense of jealousy, but that happens um, even up to this, even up to this day. And, and it's because, and it's because, um, of the sin that came from the first man, and 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 so, it, it, you we're know, human. It's it's human. It's we're, human yes, nature. it's human nature. It's part of, it's part of the human nature. Now we are saddened that it happens. We wish it would not. Um, um, but at times, the same way that the devil. I'll let you speak, Iris. The same way that the devil um, got into. Uh, Adam's head and Eve's head and and they did what they did the devil do get into our heads and so that is why it's so important to always try to foster a deep and meaningful relationship with God that mm -hmm. is important very important yes Iris actually you gave me food for thought last week when you said at church uh, that when we get to heaven you don't know who we will see. You won't expect to see certain people. And it, I was thinking all week, I was thinking, if I came face to face with Hitler, what would I do? You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you, I would, you would probably I say, Lord, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd push him off the cloud. If I was on the cloud, I'd push him off. But oh. that is he, is he one of the. You see, one of these things that we have to realize, and, and the story of Jesus on the cross um, um, being nailed to the cross between two men um, is a great example. We had one man on the cross who continued to uh, curse and get on and tell the Lord to get him off the cross if he's who he said he is. And you had the other man who said, Lord, uh, um, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Mm -hmm. and 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 jesus says to him today you will be with me in paradise and 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 you have this man who realized and who even said to his friend or whoever on the other side of the cross you know we are getting justly paid for our due for what we did but this man is not he didn't do anything and so we have to real we have to realize that um that God can forgive people at the 11th hour, the 11th hour and 59th minute. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he does. And sometimes, you know, I always say to folks, you know, <clears throat> don't think that people are unredeemable. Everybody is redeemable. Um, mm -hmm. That is not our call. That is God's call. Mm -hmm. um, we can't point fingers because you start pointing fingers at some person. How many more are coming back at you? Four. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you can't point fingers and criticize people. What our purpose is, is to pray for them and, and, and hope that God will change them. But we cannot say, you know, they're going to hell or, or what have you, because we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Some people, some people encounter God on their deathbed. And, and some people, <clears throat> and, 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 but the thing is about it is, not everybody may get that opportunity to do so. That is why we are supposed to be living our lives in such a way that we have that deep, real um, relationship with God mm -hmm. in Christ and and that is and that is how we should be living our life each and every day um, and that's how God wants us to live our life each and every day now yes will we fall short some days of course we will um, um, 
Does that mean that we cannot be forgiven? Of course we can be forgiven. Um, it, it, the problem is oftentimes is, is that sometimes we don't feel we deserve to be forgiven or we don't feel that God will forgive us. And, 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 so, um, and, 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 and so that is a lot of the time the problems that we have is not with God, it is with ourselves. And 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 we 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 have a problem adjusting to those sort of things. But mm-hmm. but I, I'm just saying all that to say we in a nutshell that we we need to realize that um uh, that we cannot say to, we cannot say that anybody is beyond redemption. Everyone mm-hmm. is forgivable. So as I said, when you get to, to heaven, you may be surprised. <laughs> you may be very surprised. I honestly, honestly, honestly believe that. I really do. I strongly believe that. Well, it'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that is true. I strongly believe that. Yes, Lisa. I, I just wanted to follow up on what Bryce said about like why, like why would people do this stuff? But is it a, is it that like God gives us free will? He doesn't Correct. force us Correct. to say you must Correct. obey the commandments and do this and do that, or I won't like you. Correct. He says, he, he said, I don't, I'm not going to force you to follow me. Exactly. So we have this, so we have this free will. Correct. And, so it's, it's a and that is true. I mean, a perfect example, if you want to example, we all know this example, the whole notion of, of um, the people of Israel um, did not want God anymore. And they wanted a, a king like everybody else. All the other nations had a human king. We want one too. We don't want you, God. We want to get what God said. Okay. You want a king here? You have him. And what he turns out to be one of the worst kings of Israel. I mean, you know. Yeah, Saul, <laughs> and well, so, Saul was one of the worst kings ever in Israel. Are you kidding yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, that's who I'm talking about, Bryce. That's who I'm talking about. So, that, so you wanted a king, God gave you a king, and look who you got. Ooh. So, so you know, um, as as we say. Uh, be careful what you wish for, hope for, whatever the case may be. But, but yes, he gave them the free will. That's what you want. He's not forcing you to say to go back to what Lisa was saying. He doesn't force us. If that's what you want, that's what you want, buddy. Yeah, God, God does give us free wills. Like even in the Lord's Prayer, like in the Old Testament of the Lord's Prayer, like God our Father wart in heaven, or even God and our Father in heaven, even in the New Testament Lord's Prayer. That God always forgives people whether they're trespasses, we, we trespass against that, and we and we forgive others that trespass against us. Mm-hmm. We also forgive people that have sinned against us as well, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like people make mistakes, Father. It's like who cares? But God always forgives you no matter what you do in life. Mm-hmm. 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 Or at least the, 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 there's the opening for forgiveness there. He's willing to forgive you. Um, uh, but you also need to ask for the forgiveness as well. Yes, Iris, you were going to say something? You have to ask for it. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And change and be willing to change. And be willing to change. Exactly. <laughs> and, be, and that is true. And be willing to change. And be yeah, willing to change. Yeah. Or at least, yeah, it be, you, you got I mean, you may not get it. You probably won't get it down pat, down perfect because you're not. But you have to have that inner heart which says, I'm willing to change. And, and that is important. All right. We have gone over an hour, but at least I finished my class within the hour. So all the other questions which are well, uh, which I love to hear and talk about, um, I think that's important. And don't worry. This morning class went over an hour too. Uh, I even started my, um, we even started the, um, the scholarship committee meeting late because I I got over late, but that is fine. It's all good. And I'm glad that you're enthusiastic. Next week, we will look at chapter two. So make sure you read chapter two for next Mm -hmm. week. Okay. Have a wonderful night, everyone. God bless you. you. See you all on Sunday. Well, see you all at the tea party if you got tickets. And if I don't see you, if you don't have tickets, which means you won't be there, but I'll see those at the tea party on Saturday. And then I'll see you all on Sunday. God bless you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night.